Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning to everyone. It is Monday. I was going to say March. Good morning, everyone. It is Monday, June the 20th. I don't know why I I was saying March. What happened? Here's what happened. Um, And I'm going to have to fix it. I, 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 I... immediately hit the go live button, right? Immediately hit the go live button. And I pulled the microphone towards me. Now, as soon as I did, I was like, wait, something is wrong. Something is wrong. So let me describe this highly professional setup that I use to bring you this podcast, right? Now, uh, I try my best to, to present a somewhat professional podcast. I do my very best. But the reality is, it's not very professional. The setup here is would be well, it would be embarrassed. Well, I think most podcasters would be embarrassed to even to even use my setup. They would probably laugh at me. I would be I would be the laughing I would be the laughing stock of the podcasting world if they saw my setup. But let me actually describe what's going on here. It's it's pretty embarrassing. So to my left, to my left is a Dell laptop. It's not a very great laptop, but it's there, all right? And it's what I use. Then I have a microphone that is plugged into the laptop. It's a USB microphone, nothing fancy. I don't have a mixer. I don't have a soundboard, nothing like that. It's just a USB microphone plugged into a laptop. That's it. And the microphone, I don't even have an actual microphone stand. What I have is the microphone. This, This is embarrassing. It is currently sitting on top of two Bible dictionaries and a Trinity hymnal. Now, the problem is this. Yesterday, obviously yesterday during, I think, Sunday school, I told everyone to open up the Trinity hymnal because we were going to make a reference to the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. And I was going to demonstrate kind of how the the concept of the church, you can see an evolution and thought of between the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, right? So we're going to do a little church history talking about the church. And obviously someone needed a a a Trinity hymnal. So they came over here and removed one of the Trinity hymnals that the microphone was standing on, because typically I have two Bible dictionaries and two Trinity hymnals to bring the microphone up a little higher. And clearly someone removed it. So as soon as I pull, as soon as I hit the the big red go live button on, you know, to, to be live on the air and I pulled the microphone towards me, I started talking and realized, wait a minute, the microphone is much lower than it usually is. That's going to impact the sound quality. So here, live on the air, I'm going to fix this, all right? Live on the air. So I'm going to grab a Trinity hymnal. I'm going to pick up the microphone. And there we go. Now the microphone is back to its normal height, all right? Yeah, that, this is my great setup. So I sit here at a table, okay? on a microphone that's sitting on top of four books, two Bible dictionaries and two Trinity hymnals. Now, the fact that my microphone is sitting on top of two hymnals and two Bible dictionaries, does that make this the most spiritual podcast out there, right? Do I get any spiritual points because my microphone is sitting on. No, I'm telling you, uh, people who do podcasting, they have far better setups, far more professional setups. And I guess sometimes it, I guess maybe sometimes it bothers me that I don't have a more professional podcasting setup. Maybe, Maybe it bothers me. I'm getting ready to take a drink of water. But there maybe it's because of my tech, technical knowledge i don't have i don't have enough technical expertise to maybe have the setup that other people have or i don't have the money but at the same time i think now you now that we have we have listeners who listen to lots of podcasts all right so it would be interesting i mean just, and i i just have to add, just I know this is not really what what you uh, we we uh, that w- this is well, this is not really the topic that we are supposed to be talking about, and I know this is not what you tuned in for. But I, I do have to ask this question. I do have to ask this question. How do you think? And you can be honest with me. 
You can be honest with me. How do you think the sound quality of the Theology Central podcast compares to other podcasts? Are we are we anywhere close? Are we so far below other podcasts that it's kind of embarrassing and so you don't want any like you wouldn't want anyone to know that you listen to this or do you think you know we're you know we're we're even? I mean, where 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 would you rank the sound quality? Where where I know we get kind of an echo cuz I'm here in the in the sanctuary. I don't I'm not obviously in a studio. We don't we, I don't obviously have soundproofing panels on the wall right here next to me or you know I'm in a in a smaller room with, you know, sound uh soundproof panels. So, and I don't do any mixing of of my voice, so I can't add or take things out that would that would possibly give a more warmer sound or a closer sound. So, I mean, it's just a cheap microphone with a cheap laptop sitting and the microphone is not even on an actual microphone stand. I, I think based on our setup, I think we do pretty well. I, I think so. When Back when I did the News and Focus program, I, I uh, compared to all of the other people on Sermon Audio, I think we exceeded the sound quality of almost everyone on, on Sermon Audio. Even some of the sermons preached on Sermon Audio, you have to listen and go, who is your sound person? What in the world is going on there? So I, we, I think I used to be like, okay, I think I think we're I think we're doing the best we can. Um, now even there, I was using a very cheap setup, but I just used every trick I could to try to improve the sound. Um, so I, I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully it's good enough. But there you have it. A little <laughs> impromptu discussion about my uh, podcasting setup. It wasn't my intention. I really wanted to get right to the topic, but. I just realized as soon as I started talking, the microphone is way lower than it's supposed to be. And the only way I can fix this is to find the uh, Trinity hymnal. And, and and I was going to have to explain what I was doing. So there you have it. So hopefully, does, does it sound okay now? So let, let's do our introduction again. Should I should I play our introduction again? Should, should I play it? Or should, okay, here we go. Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning to everyone. It is Monday, June the 21st, 2021. It is currently 9.50 a.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the heart of West Texas, Ovalo, Texas. Okay, Ovalo, Texas is not really the heart of West Texas, but I'm coming to you live from Victory Baptist Church, Ovalo, Texas, right here inside the empty sanctuary of Victory Baptist Church. Thank you for tuning in wherever you may be listening, however you may be listening. It is greatly appreciated. Thank you so very much. If you're listening to us live, always feel free to jump in and say hello, good morning, good afternoon, offer questions, thoughts, comments, whatever you would like to say. Feel Definitely feel free to say anything you would like. If you're not listening to us live, you really should be, and if you would like to know how to do that, just simply email me at newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at, yahoo, at, <laughs> newsif at yahoo.com. Yeah, I'm having a wonderful start of this day. Newsif at yahoo.com and say, I would like to listen live, and I will send you links and give you all the explanation. It's absolutely free, and if you would like to do that, we would invite you to be a part of the live listening audience. I think Sunday yesterday we had... I think that was one of the largest live audiences that we've had. If you take all of the numbers for all the people who listen live throughout the day, we we did we did pretty good. It may be the most ever. So I'm 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 very uh, glad for that. You just you never know. You just I mean sometimes I'm live on the air and literally no one's listening live, zero. And then there's other times a lot of people are listening live. So um, whatever the case may be, however you may listen, thank you very much. We greatly appreciate it. Now. We have a little fun right there, a little joking around, and I'm kind of glad we started that way because we're going to be talking about a very, very serious subject. That is no, that is not a laughing matter. It's not funny, and it's it's nothing really to joke about. We're going to be talking about the we're going to be talking about the subject of depression in the life of a Christian. Depression. And the life of a Christian. Now, depression, 
This comes from the American Psychiatric Association. What is depression? Again, the American Psychiatric Association, psychiatry, uh, psychiatry.org is the website, but this comes from the American Psychiatric Association. Here we go. What is depression? Depression is a common and serious medical illness that negatively affects how you feel, the way you think, and how you act. I want you to really, really think about what I just said. Depression is a common and serious medical illness that negatively affects how you feel, the way you think, and how you act. Now, why is that so very important? Because as a Christian, we obviously want to be the, the thing that... that um, affects how we think, how we act, and how we feel, what we would like to, to, to say as a Christian, what really affects how I feel, how I think, and how I act is God's Word. God's Word should, uh, should impact how I feel. God's Word should definitely impact how I think, and God's Word should be the thing that affects how I act. So if depression is something else that comes along, and impacts how you feel, how you think, and how you act, you can see that immediately becomes a part of spiritual warfare. That depression really is a part of spiritual warfare because it's a very common thing. Now, I know within Christianity, we, in many cases, instead of saying, oh, depression, we will blame depression and and some circles of Christianity on, you know, demonic forces or satanic forces and that it's a satanic attack it's a it's a spiritual attack and and then they want to bind the the demon of depression and they view it from that perspective but let's just be honest here depression is a medical illness that negatively affects how you feel the way you think and how you act so i think as a christian as you as a part of discipleship you really have to learn uh, about the de- the possible negative impact, and I'm sorry, I'm dropping things here, the possible negative impact that something like depression could have on your spiritual life, and not just your life in general, but your spiritual life. I mean, here's this thing, depression, it's a, it's a medical illness, and the next thing you know, it's impacting how you feel, how you think, and how you act. And it's obviously, it's not God's word. It's something other than God's word impacting your emotion, your thinking, and your actions. And we want, uh, uh, we want all of that to be shaped and impacted by the very words of Scripture. Now, there's a lot of things that can, that can impact how you feel. There are a lot of things that can impact how you think. There are a lot of things that can impact your actions. And really, anything that comes along that tries to impact these three areas, that's not God's word, you have to be very careful to go, wait a minute, no, God's word is the, it should be the thing that has the biggest impact in my life in these three areas feelings, thinking, and action. So I I found that definition to be extremely um, important, especially from a spiritual perspective. Uh, Fortunately, depression is treatable, again, according to the American Psychiatric Association. Depression causes feelings of sadness and or a loss of interest in activities you once enjoyed It can lead to a variety of emotional and physical problems and can increase and can decrease your ability to function at work and at home. Uh, Depression uh, depression symptoms can vary from mild to severe, and they can include feeling sad or having a depressed mood, loss of interest or pleasure in activities once enjoyed, changes in appetite, weight loss or, or, or weight gain unrelated to dieting, trouble sleeping or sleeping too much, loss of energy or increased fatigue, increased in a purposeless physical activity, uh, inability to sit still, pacing, uh, handwriting, or slowed 
movements or, or speech. These actions uh, must be severe enough to be observable by others. Um, feeling worthless or guilt, difficulty thinking, concentrating or making decisions, thoughts of death or suicide. Right now, there's there's a lot going on there, but just think about all of those things would have a profound impact on your spiritual life. All of those things would have a profound impact in your in your Christian walk, in your spiritual walk, in your spiritual journey. It would have a profound impact there, and it could lead to really flawed, unbiblical thinking, and could lead to very unbiblical action. Now I now I'm not saying that you can say well I did you know that it, this is a built-in excuse hey I you know I was depressed and I did this this and this see it wasn't my fault I'm not 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 saying that I'm saying the reality is this is something that is common it is serious and it can have a profound impact on one's spiritual life and I don't know how much discussion that really happens within Christianity I think we have a tendency to view this as I'm under satanic attack I'm under demonic attack. I'm under demonic oppression. And it may be just a medical illness known as depression. And so we need to recognize it. We need to be willing to acknowledge it. And we need to think about it from a biblical perspective. All right. So let's start here. Now, I'm going to be using an article. You can find it at the Way of Life uh, website, wayoflife.org. It was published on June the 3rd. It was actually, it was originally published way back in 2017, uh, but the author enlarged it on June the 3rd, 2021. And he he borrowed heavily from Charles Spurgeon's uh, lectures to my students. He borrowed heavily from that, and then he kind of structured it in his own way. The author is David Cloud. I don't always agree with everything that he says. I do have a lot of his writings right here next to me, uh, so I, I, I have used them at different times. I do check his Way of Life literature website frequently. And he does a thing called Friday Friday uh, Church Notes, where they look at you know news uh, from a Christian perspective. Again, don't always agree with, with everything. But again, just it's a smaller ministry. I, I like those smaller ministries that maybe don't have that mainstream ap- uh, appeal. I just kind of like that more kind of smaller underground kind of, of ministries. Um, and so I, I check it out on a regular basis. But And I've talked to David Cloud via email a couple times. He's always been very nice. So here we go. This is very important. Now, I'm and again, I'm, I'm basing many of my comments on what he has here. Some will be direct quotes. Some will be, I'm just looking at what he says and I go my own complete direction, all right? So just want to make sure you understand that there's a source behind it, but then a lot of it is just going to be mine. So let's talk about depression and the Christian. First and foremost, we've established that depression is a, is a medical illness that impacts emotion, thinking, and action. All right. The symptoms clearly demonstrate how it can have a profound impact on your spiritual life, not just your life in general. All right. So it's something as Christians we have to think about. And I want to start our thinking about it in regards to the makeup of ourselves as human beings. I think it's very important that we understand some concepts here because we need to lay a a very important scriptural foundation. Now, to me, this is very basic stuff but I think it's sometimes very much overlooked within elements of Christianity, and I will explain why in a minute. And I hope that you really grasp this because it may help eliminate maybe some guilt and shame that has been heaped upon you by other believers, all right? So here we go. When it comes to the makeup of of ourselves as human beings, one passage that comes into play is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, right? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Right, First Thessalonians chapter five verse twenty three, and we learn, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I don't want to get into an exegesis of the verse, but I want to use the verse to say that it demonstrates that as human beings we're made up of different parts, right? Body 
soul, and spirit. Now, some will argue that uh, soul and spirit are used interchangeably, so we're really made up of two parts. Others say, no, we're made up of three parts. I'm not here to get into that debate. In one of the Bible schools I went to, we had a, we spent an entire semester debating on whether we're made up of two parts or three parts. And I, at, by the end of the semester, I guess it was interesting, but I don't know if we if it was really anything profitable by the time it was over. It just seemed like a lot of arguing without any real idea. But the point is, is you're made up of different parts. That's what I want you to take from it. You're made up from different parts, okay? Um, if you look at Matthew, I believe it's twenty two thirty seven, we see another kind of passage that kind of gives us this idea. Matthew chapter 22, all right? Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. Matthew twenty two thirty seven. 37. Jesus said unto him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. All right? Body, soul, spirit. Here we have the idea of uh, with all your uh, heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. All right? Again, just demonstrating different parts of, of ourselves, different parts of ourselves. Um, if we look at Ephesians, I believe, 4.23. Ephesians 4.23. Ephesians 4.23. We read this, Ephesians 4.23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. All right? So again, referring to a, a, a part of us. So we are made up of different parts. We all know we have a, a physical body. We know there's a spiritual part to us. We know a part of that physical body. We also have a mind. We have, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that deals with our thinking. We have our emotions. Then we just have the, the physical body, uh, you know, and all the different parts of the physical body where we can get sick, bones can be broken, all the different things that can happen. So we are made up of very different parts. Now, this is very important. We are made up of very different parts, but all of those parts are impacted by one very important spiritual truth. We are all sinners, right? And we are depraved. Now, think, so we are sinners. We are depraved, right? We have depravity. We are, as Christians, or as all people, we are born as depraved sinners. We are conceived in sin. We are brought forth as sinners. So every area of our life is negatively impacted by sin, including our physical body, which is in a sense under the curse of sin. Therefore, our physical body, it wears down, it gets tired, it gets sick, it, it will ultimately wear out and we will die. That's all a part of living in a fallen world. All of creation has been subject to vanity because of the fall. All everything, all of creation groans, all of it. We see it we see it in the world around us. Everything groans waiting for that day of redemption because everything is under the curse of sin. So guess what? Every part of you is impacted by sin. Now, immediately, that should tell you something, okay? If all, every part of me is impacted by sin, everyone acknowledges that with the physical body, right? Well, that's why, that's why you get sick. That's why your body wears out. That's why you get tired. That's why you have to eat. That, the, the, all the different things that you have to do to sustain yourself. And if you don't eat, you're going to get tired and you're going to get weak and you have to drink water and, you have to, you, and you, you have to do all of these things to maintain your body. And eat, no matter how much you maintain it, no matter how healthy you try to keep it, there's going to slowly but surely, it is breaking down. Slowly but surely, it's going to get weaker. Slowly but surely, it's going to change and, and, and it's going to deteriorate. That's just, just, just no question about it. We all acknowledge that with our physical body. Everyone acknowledges that. And becoming a Christian does not magically change that fact, right? Doesn't matter. So the, the effects of sin on your body are still there even after you become a Christian. Well, guess what? The effects of depravity still remain in you even after your conversion, even after salvation. And guess what that sin can affect? Well, that, that sinful nature affects the way you think, it affects how you feel, and it affects how you act. Correct? 
I mean, there's no way to get around that, right? We have sin inside of us. We are constantly fighting that sin. We are trying to mortify the flesh. We're trying to put off the old and put on the new. It's a constant battle, right? It, our, it, 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 the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, the reason everything in the world can appeal to us is because we have sin inside of us. So if sin can affect, think of it this way, if sin can affect our physical body, if sin can affect, in a sense, us spiritually and our, and our desires and our thoughts and our actions and our feelings, then clearly you take that all into effect. Guess what can greatly be affected by all of this? Your emotional health, your mental health can be negatively affected by all of this. Just as your physical body can get sick, mentally you can get sick. Mentally, you can have an illness. And that happens whether one is saved or unsaved. Sometimes we are like, everyone acknowledges, oh, you're a Christian, but you're still going to get sick. But it's almost like if you're a Christian, you should never suffer with any mental health illness. It's almost like we somehow like, once you become a Christian, all mental health issues should just magically disappear. You should never be depressed. You should never be, you know, diagnosed with any mental health issues, no matter what, what they can be, Right. Uh, multiple uh, personality issues. Uh, I mean, just just go through all the different mental health issues. The point is, sometimes Christians teach that you should never experience those. Well, why not? Why not? Because listen, it sin still impacts every part of our being. Sin is still there, impacting every part of our being: the way we think, the way we feel, and the way we act. It impacts our physical body. So if we can get physically sick and have all kinds of physical problems after conversion, then why do we somehow put a, almost a negative feeling, right? There's almost this negative connotation, this negative idea of thinking, oh, that person claims to be a Christian and they're having that mental health issue and that mental health issue. Oh, there's something wrong with them spiritually. You know, there's something wrong with them spiritually. If they really cared about God and thought about, they wouldn't be struggling with that. I don't know what, you know, just, you're depressed. Get over it. Well, why are you having all, what is wrong with that person? Because mental health issues, people, people who, like when they look at someone with a mental health issue, they don't understand it, right? It's not like, oh, you broke your arm, you broke your leg. You, so, some physical conditions people can actually see. They can actually see. So it's it's more real to someone. If they cannot really see the physical manifestation of your problem, right? If they can't see, oh man, that person can barely walk it. They can't see the physical manifestation of it. In many cases, people have a feeling, now, and now listen, they will almost treat it like it's not real. People can even do that with something like you have a seizure disorder. Like I have a seizure disorder and it comes with all kinds of neurological problems. I was having some neurological problems yesterday. Things just did not feel right. But nobody can see that. Now, they can see when I fall on the floor and, you know, have a massive seizure. They can see that. But even that, there's times people are like, you know, I don't know if that's really real. It's, I wonder if that per- I've had people almost question the reality of my diagnosis. I'm like, well, you can go talk to the doctors if you don't believe it. You can, you can I mean, I can, I can try to prove it to you medically. But I, I think when it comes to mental health issues, people are just like, you know, I wonder if they're just making a bigger deal out of this. I wonder if they're just exaggerating it. I mean, I mean, why don't they just get over it? Why don't they just trust in God? Well, guess what? You can trust in God and have all kinds of physical issues. You can trust in God and still have multiple mental health issues. Becoming a Christian, listen, think of it this way. Becoming a Christian doesn't, number one, just remove depravity from you. So you continue to struggle with sin. You're always going to struggle with sin. You're going to fall and you're going to fall. And that's why when Christians preach that if anyone is in Christ or a new creature, old things are passed away, all things have become new. And they preach that as being a practical reality. They're doing a disservice to everyone because you're going to realize really quick, not everything is new and the old is still clearly present inside of you. Right. So that is true in my position before God. And it is true in how I should view another Christian that I, because of God's mercy and grace and forgiveness and the blood of Jesus Christ and because of imputed righteousness, I view them as a new creature. But the reality is we're still very much the old is still very present. So it's true of us in a spiritual sense that depravity is still there. 
You know what else is true um, as for a Christian? That we have a body that is still, in a sense, under the curse of sin, and it's going to die, and it deteriorates, it gets sick, it gets weak, and it has all kinds of problems. And guess what else is true? Because even as a Christian, we are, our minds and our emotions are impacted not only by sin, but is vulnerable to mental illness. You have to see all of that you have to see all of that reality. And Christians sometimes are like, yo, you become a Christian. It's just gone. You're not going to, no, it's like, like, you know, it's like, okay, here are the, like all Christians have to pretend almost like, like they never struggle with any men, mental health issues. And I think the more you, you pretend that you never struggle with them, places you in a, in a land of denial where you cannot ultimately gain spiritual victory over it. What do we say in regards to if someone's going to become a Christian, what do they have to do? They have to acknowledge their sin, right? They have to acknowledge their sin. Well, it's, it's true with any mental health issue. You've got to acknowledge the reality of it. You've got to, something is not right. Now, in many cases, you can't see that, but the point is you, it's, there's nothing, it doesn't make you a less, it doesn't make you less of a Christian because you struggle with these issues, and the issue in the the issue that i really want to focus on here is the issue of depression all right now here i'm going to read how uh, this article uh, deals with this man is a complicated being made up of body soul and spirit also there is the heart soul and mind there is the spirit of the mind in his fallen condition and a fallen world Man is subject to a great number of afflictions that affect every aspect of his being. Every aspect of our being is affected by our fallen condition. All right? That's why we still struggle with sin. We will always struggle with sin. That's why we still sin on a regular and consistent basis. And people may deny that, but it's just the reality. You can pretend all day, but I doubt you ever love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul in any meaningful way or love your neighbor as yourself or when God calls you to be holy as he is holy, you're never going to pull any of that off. So you live in a constant state of sin, all right? That's just the reality of it, right? With no excuse for it. And guess what? Every other aspect of your being is affected, your physical body, and that can include your mental health, all right? Now, Here, according to this article, are some biblical truths about depression and emotional melancholy, and they're going to rely heavily on Charles Spurgeon's lectures to my students. Let's see some things that they want us to determine, all right? So man is made up of different parts. Man is in his fallen condition, depraved sinner, and all of that impacts every aspect of our life, including our physical health, our mental health, our emotions, our actions, our thoughts. Now, as a Christian, let's make sure we battle against that depravity and its impact through a scripture. Now, we, 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 can, we can do so much physically with our bodies. Obviously, we can try to eat healthy. We can exercise. There's things that we can do there. We have to fight that. But then spiritually, all of these other things, we try to renew our mind with the word of God. We try to take every thought into captivity. We try to uh, develop our emotions and, and follow the, the allow scripture to determine how we should feel and what we should do. So, so there's a spiritual battle involved in all of this. But here's some points they make. Number one, depression. Now, and I say number one because this is their number one. I've given you a lot of other points, but you get the idea. Depression is part of this fallen life and its reason will not always be known. Now, I would like to change this. Depression is a part of this fallen life. I'm going to leave out the reason part. And here's the reason why. Because we may never know the specific reason, but we do know the general reason right? The general reason is understood. We live in a fallen world with bodies that are under the curse of sin. And until we receive a new body and, you know, 
Until then, this body and all of its weaknesses are there, not only physical, but also being sub- subjected and vulnerable to mental illness. So we live in a fallen world and we are depraved sinners, so we're vulnerable to all of these issues. And that and that and, and becoming a Christian doesn't make that go away. Now, they have some scriptures they have here. First, they have Psalm 119, verse 28. Psalm 119, verse 28. Psalm 119, verse 28. We're just going to look at the scriptures that they have here and see what they do with them and why they quote them and see what we can learn from it. All right, here we go. Psalm 119, verse 28. We read these words. My soul melteth for heaviness. Strengthen thou me according unto thy word. Now my soul melteth for heaviness. That's a very, that's, that's like inside of me. Emotionally, I'm melting because of some kind of heaviness. What a vivid word picture. Let's, let's look this up in a number of other translations to see how others handle this, all right? We, we could spend a lot of time on this verse, but we'll see. We'll just... You know what? We're, we're not gonna, I'm not going to worry about how far we get. I'm going to just worry about trying to deal with this subject in a very meaningful, thoughtful way. All right? Here we go. Um, a couple of translations. Psalm 119, 28. My soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. New Living Translation. I weep with sorrow. Encourage me by your word. English uh, Standard Version. My soul melts away for sorrow. And then the King James, my soul melteth for heaviness. It's the heaviness. The sorrow is so deep that literally the, the, the soul is, is becoming weary. It's melting away. It's, it's, you talk about depression, discouragement, wanting to give up. You're literally melting away on the inside. And what does the psalmist do here? First, I want to just show you, it's acknowledging the reality of this acknowledging there's nothing wrong with acknowledging it now i know in some churches nobody wants to be like oh what's wrong with that that person's always upset the person's always down and sometimes people are not very compassionate and very understanding or they view you as not being spiritual now there is a spiritual aspect to all of this but you have to acknowledge it but i do find this my soul melteth for heaviness strengthen thou me according unto thy word Now, Psalm 119, verse 28, when I read that, I understand what I'm reading, but I also understand how difficult this verse is to be put into practice in any meaningful way. Now, let me explain. When, when, When things are not right inside, like emotionally, you're just depressed. Everything is like, in a sense, melting away inside of you. There is a weariness. You're just overwhelmed with sorrow and discouragement and depression. You know what can be the hardest thing to do? To pick up God's word and be encouraged by it. Because a lot of times when you have that feeling and you pick up God's word, it just feels like nothing. It's like, I I can't explain this. Maybe you understand it. Maybe you don't. So there, there's, there's those days for whatever reason, right? Now this deals with sorrow. We don't know if it's something specific, but we're just going to deal with the emotion here. There are times where whatever the reason, there's just an emotion inside and I can sit down with God's word and it's like no verse. It just, the verse doesn't really leap off the page. It doesn't really do anything. And I'm just reading and I'm just reading. And it's like, I don't even know what to write down. I don't even know what to do. And it's just like, I feel like nothing is happening. And sometimes that even adds to my discouragement. It's like, okay, I'm discouraged. I need God's word. But when I go to God's word, it just feels dead and cold. And uh, and so then it makes me even more discouraged and frustrated, which then starts a very horrible cycle. Here's what I can tell you. When you're doing that, don't allow the heaviness, the sorrow, the discouragement to keep you from God's word. You just keep 
You just keep reading. You keep listening. Listen to sermons. Listen to devotional messages. Use devotional guides. You just keep at it. You, you may just say, okay, you may go for 30 minutes and not get anything out of it, but you know what? You do your 30 minutes, and then tomorrow you do the same thing. You've got to force yourself because it is God's word that we have to turn to for our encouragement, for our correction, for our rebuke, for what we need, for our, our spiritual strength. It's going to come from God's word. But what the, the article wants to do here is just demonstrate that, see, even the psalmist experienced this. Even the psalmist experienced that kind of emotion and experienced this heaviness that was inside. Depression is a part of this fallen life. It's just a part of it. Everyone's going to experience it to some level. Some people, I think, are presupposed to maybe struggling with it more than others, but everyone's going to have those times. Don't allow it to keep you from God's word, right? Now, you may spend time with God's word and your depression and your your heaviness still may remain, but don't allow, don't stop. Just keep, turn on, uh, you know, Christian radio. Good, when I say good Christian radio, not the Christian radio that sounds like entertainment, Christian radio where there's hymns, Bible reading, devotional thoughts, you know, a very solid conservative Christian radio station where it feels like you're being spiritually edified, you're not being spiritually entertained, not something that's just going to be background noise. And maybe nothing that is said really helps, but if you'll just soak yourself into the, the hymns of the faith, Bible reading, devotional thought. It's amazing that slowly but surely it may help pull you out of that uh, from a spiritual perspective, all right? Another verse they have here, a verse is Romans chapter 8, verses 22 through 23. Romans chapter 8. Now, we've been talking about this a lot in my church. Romans chapter 8, verse 22. Romans chapter 8, verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. Everything is groaning under the curse of sin. And we groan even within ourselves. We groan waiting for the adoption, waiting for the redemption of our bodies, waiting for, for when I can be free of this body that's under the curse of sin and I can be free of that and then I'll have a new body. And guess what? No more sin. And guess what? Then those mental health issues will be gone as well. Everything groans under it. Everything groans under it, All right? Now, yeah, I, I could start preaching my, my sermons from, from the Romans chapter 8, but I will not right now, all right? Go to 1 Peter 1.6. 1 Peter 1.6. 1 Peter 1.6. 1 Peter 1.6. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. It's a reality. In this world, you're going to face tribulation. In this world, you're going to face this heaviness. And, and look, sometimes there's a specific cause. Uh, this trial, this tribulation, this tragedy. Sometimes there is, you don't even know why. You don't even know why you're feeling it. You don't know why you're, 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 you're just depressed or discouraged or it's just something is going on inside of you. Anytime you have these feelings that are going on inside of you, that's, that's affecting the way you feel, affecting the way you think, affecting what you do, and it's not coming from the scriptures, you know right there, that's a red light. Spiritual battle is in pl is taking place. Whenever that happens, that's a red light for you. It's like a warning sign. You just you need to literally find a war a warning siren on your phone. Download the uh, the sound, and whenever you start going, wait a minute, I'm feeling this feeling is not coming from God's word. This thinking is not coming. This, what I want to do or what I find myself doing is not coming from God's word. You need to play that si warning siren because that is telling you you're now involved in a spiritual war. 
And now you've got to take those thoughts captive. You've got to renew your mind. You've got to now try to put that off and put on the new. Now, now that it's a part of the fallen world. You're going to experience it, but when you experience it, you realize something is hijacking you. Something is hijacking you. And now you got to fight against it, and you fight against it with God's word. All right? But it's going to be a part of your life. Now, he's got a lot of quotes from Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Let's consider some of them. Quote number one. I note that some whom I greatly love and esteem, who are in my judgment among the very choicest of God's people, nevertheless travel most of the way to heaven by night. Charles Adam Spurgeon, great preacher, very famous. Even if you don't know who he is, that's okay. He is acknowledging that some of the people that he greatly love and esteem highly that in his judgment, some of there are some of God's you know choicest people, they nevertheless, even though this is all true, that they're very spiritual and you know God seems to be using them greatly, they travel most of the way to heaven by night. What does he mean by that? That they traveled to, to heaven by night in the midst of maybe depression, discouragement, frustration, physical problems. They travel there by night, but they still travel on the way there. And for many of us, there, there can be a life that's filled with a lot of nighttime, to use that phrase. Se- second quote, Spurgeon speaking, I am the subject of depression, so fearful that I hope none of you ever get to such extremes of wretched- wretchedness as I go to. There's Charles Hasen Spurgeon acknowledging that he's a subject of depression and it is so bad. The extreme of wretchedness that he experiences is so bad that he wishes no one would ever experience it. That's that's the kind of honesty we need. Uh, He he goes on to say, um, third quote, hours after I have been myself depressed and I have felt uh, an inability to shake it off. So he has, he here he's referring to, and again, these quotes are just taken out of their broader context. So you could look up lectures to my students and read them. But there he's talking about being depressed and feeling an inability to shake it off. Look, you can't just shake off depression. You can't just say, depression, go away. Just get over it. It doesn't work that way. It requires, it's a battle, requires a fight. And there's a lot of things that have to go to, to go in there. Now, yes, there are things you can try to do, you know, proper nutrition, rest, exercise. is Now, you're don't not going to feel like you want exercise. You're not going to feel like what you want to eat, but sometimes you've got to force yourself to do that. And then, of course, there are times where it's going to require uh, medical intervention, maybe through medication. Now, again, you can use everything else before you do that. I'm not a big, you know, anti We can get a whole discussion about the medication, but just understand that there's a time that you may not have a choice, all right? Um, he, another quote from Spurgeon. I could weep by the hour like a child, and yet I knew not what I wept for. There's Spurgeon acknowledging he could weep hour after hour and not even know why he was weeping, not even know why he was crying. Now, that's always, that's always a crazy place uh, to be in. Uh, Spurgeon goes on to say, there's a lot of quotes here. I need something which shall cheer my heart. Why, I cannot tell. Wherefore, I do not know. But I have a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. My soul is cast down within me. I feel as if I had rather die than live. All that God hath done by me seems to be forgotten. And my spirit flags and my courage breaks down. I need your prayers. Wow. There's some reality right there. There's some reality. Now, he, he believed that maybe this was, you know, Satan a messenger from Satan. But remember, if it was a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, we know God obviously allows it to be there. So now we get into the sovereignty of God. Let's just make it very clear. Doesn't require any satanic intervention. Doesn't require anything. You live in a fallen world. You have a bro, you, have, you are a sinner. So you are depraved. That depravity impacts every part of your being. And because your body is under the curse of sin, and you can get physically ill, you can then experience mental illness as well. 
and it doesn't require any kind of satanic intervention or anything else there. Now, I do believe it's all under the sovereign control of God for his purpose and his glory, and, but that could lead us into a different line of reasoning. Right now, I just want us to talk about the reality here, all right? Spurgeon goes on. We have our times of natural sadness. We have, too, our times of depression when we cannot do otherwise than hang our heads. Seasons of lethargy will also befall us from changes in our natural frame or from weariness or the rebound of, of overexcitement. The trees are not always green. The sap sleeps in them in the winter, and we have winters too. Life cannot always be at the flood tide. The fullness of the blessings is not upon the most gracious at all times. That's a beautiful word picture. Hey, trees are not always green, right? Flowers are not always in bloom, right? The uh, To use another Im- imagery here, uh, the, 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 the lake is not always at the flood tide. It's not always full, right? The, all around us, life goes in these cycles, and we can experience those spiritually. Now, the thing is, when we experience a winter, or when things don't appear to be the way it should be, we can, we have to Im- Im- immediately battle against that spiritually and not allow that to then impact the way we feel, the way we think, and how we act because we have to allow Scripture to, to be the thing motive, guiding that, controlling that, and influencing that. He goes on to say, Causeless depression is not to be reasoned with, nor can David's harp charm it away by sweet discoursings. As well as well fight with the mist as with the shapeless, undefinable, undefi- yet all beclouding hopelessness. One affords himself no pity when in this case, because it seems so unreasonable and even sinful to be troubled without manifest cause, and yet troubled the man is, even in the very depths of his spirit. If those who laugh at such melancholy did not feel the grief of it for one hour, their laughter would be sobered uh, into compassion. Resolution might perhaps shake it off, but where are we to find the resolution when the whole man is unstrung? The physician and the divine may unite their skill in such cases, both find their hands full and more than full. The iron bolt, which so mysteriously fastens the door of hope and holds our spirits in gloomy prison, needs a heavenly hand to push it back. All right, now let's take some of this apart. Causeless depression. In other words, you're depressed and you don't know why. You don't know what's going on. That's the kind of depression he's talking about. He calls it a causeless depression and that it's not just going to go away because of any sweet discourse or, or anything else. As well, you as well fight with the mist as with this shapeless, undefinable, yet all beclouding hopelessness. You just as well go outside and fight the mist. Go outside and fight the fog. Oh, it's foggy. Go out there and fight it. You can't do anything to it. You can't t- you can't grab onto it. It's it's nothing tangible. When you well, when you have a depression that's causeless, it's like uh, what I don't know what's going on. I don't what there's nothing to grab onto, and, and it becomes almost a a, a, a battle, a, a fight of futility. One affords himself no pity when in this case, because it seems so unreasonable and even sinful to be troubled without manifest cause. It's hard to, it seems almost like, well, I don't have a reason to be feeling this way. So, you know, I've got to be, I'm obviously sinning within that, that, you know, then adds guilt to it. And it just becomes this, this endless cycle of a fight that doesn't make any sense. And he says, now there are those who laugh at such melancholy, but, but, but did but feel the grief of it for one hour, their laughter would be sobered into compassion. If they could feel it for one hour, there's a lot of people who laugh at that and don't get it. Like, what's your problem? But if they could feel it, all oh, that, <laughs> that laughter would turn into compassion quickly, right? And sometimes people, a lot of people just don't understand it because that it, they, maybe it's not something that they struggle with. Now, this has happened. Resolution could possibly shake it off, but where is the resolution going to come from? 
Where, where, you can say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to resolve it. You, 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 the resolution is gone. I'm going to do this. It's gone. And he says, sometimes every, everyone, no one has an ability to fix it. It requires a spiritual pushback. It, re, it requires divine intervention. Now, again, in their times, they did not, in, in, in Spurgeon's time, they wouldn't have had medical solutions for this. They, they wouldn't have even understood exactly what was going on. We have a better understanding of it from a medical perspective. And again, you want to, in many cases, check out all your options. You want to check out every option. What can I do without, what, what are all of my options without uh, pharmaceutical intervention, right? What are all the natural things I can do? You want to look at all of that. And then sometimes you, you may have to, then pursue the pharmaceutical intervention. And then one other quote. Uh, this comes. This doesn't come from lecture to my students. This comes from uh, one of his sermons uh, from the Metropolitan Tabernacle Pulpit, 1881, volume 27. And he, uh, Spurgeon, I guess, was preaching this. I know that wise brethren say, you should not give away to feelings of depression. If those who blame quiet so furiously could once know what depression is, they would think it cruel to scatter blame where comfort is needed. There are experiences of the children of God which are full of spiritual darkness. And I'm almost persuaded that those of God's servants who have been most highly favored have nevertheless suffered more times of darkness than others. The covenant is never known to Abraham so well as when a horror of great darkness comes over him and then he sees the shining lamp moving between the pieces of the sacrifice. I believe that's Genesis 15. A a greater than Abraham was early led of the spirit into the wilderness and yet again, he he closed his life. He was sorrowful and very heavy in the garden. No sin is necessarily connected with the sorrow of heart. For Jesus Christ, our Lord, once said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death, right? So Christ was without sin, but he felt sorrow. So in other words, it doesn't have to be a specific sin that causes it, right? Um, it says here, there was no sin in him and consequently none uh, in, his de- in his deep depression, I would therefore try to cheer any brother who is sad for I would therefore try to cheer any brother who is sad for his sadness is not necessarily blameworthy worthy. If his downcast spirit arises from unbelief, let him flog himself and cry to God to be delivered from it. But if the soul is sighing, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. It's being slain is not a fault. The way of sorrow is not the way of sin, but a hallowed road sanctified by the prayers of myriads of pilgrims now with God. Pilgrims who passing through the valley of of Baca, uh, literally uh, the valley of weeping, made it a well. The rain also filled the pools of such it is written. They go from strength to strength, even of them in Zion appeareth before God. What is he saying? The road to, to heaven is filled with the pilgrims and saints that gone before us. And they did so in many cases in times of great pain, depression, and with many tears. And that same path we're going to walk because it's a part of this life. Now, yes, if our depression, if our sin arises because of an unbelief or because of clear sin, then by all means, we repent. We turn back to God. But there is depression is a part of this world. We must fight against it. Now, I'm going to throw out a comment here. We're at 58 minutes, so I'm not going to be able to really articulate this, but I want you to think about it. Now, I believe that God works all things according to his good purpose, his will, all right? I believe that God, well, that's interesting. There was no chance of rain today, (laughs) and all of a sudden, the cloud, the skies have opened and it is pouring down rain right now. Okay. Is that not symbolic? Okay. That's, that's sometimes that's what life feels like. It's like, okay, there's a cloud just over me and it's pouring down rain. Okay. Um, but I, I find great comfort in the rain. I, I, but okay, we won't go into all of that. Okay. But here, here's what I want you to consider. Okay. I strongly believe in the sovereignty of God and God's providence. 
Now, we've been talking about God's providence in our study in Romans chapter 8. You can look for the series, Six Words Every Christian Should Know. Right, it's under, under the VBC podcast. Now, you may not like the way I'm taking us through this section, but we've really been digging in to the doctrine of God's providence. And I believe God works all things, everything out to his good purpose and his will. And I think that there are, and I want you to really think about this. I think there is a very profound spiritual purpose in my depression and discouragement and in yours. And I think one of the things that we can always take from it is when I'm depressed and discouraged and I don't know what's going on, it should make me as passionate as I can to look towards heaven, look towards the time where there'll be no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears, no more death. This body will be transformed into a glorious body that is not subjected to vanity, not subjected to sickness, not subjected to mental health issues, not subjected to depression. But that was, is not going to happen. And now. now I'm walking a path where there is going to be times of discouragement, but that discouragement should, for, should make me look towards heaven and say, okay, now it's difficult. Now it's, but I look forward to the time. Christ has already secured that for me through his death and his, his salvation. He's already secured that for me. I cannot lose it, no matter how discouraged, no matter how frustrated, no matter how many times I fell, my salvation is secure because of an imputed righteousness that comes from Christ and my sins are removed as far as the east is from the west. I can cling on to those realities. I can cling on to the reality of my salvation and the reality of an eternity that is secured for me by what Christ did. Not because of what I can do or how I feel, but what Christ did. And I can, it, it, it forces me to look there and it should. So number one, it should force me to look to heaven, look to my salvation. I guess three things. It should force me to look to my salvation, look to heaven. And I guess a third thing, it should cause me to no longer love the world. It should cause me to let go of my love and infatuation with the world because the world can never bring any true satisfaction. Just some thoughts there. Now, we could flesh those out a little more, but I'll stop right there. We're in an hour and two minutes. I hope something said today was beneficial. I hope. I I just want you to understand, depression is a part of living in a fallen world with a fallen a body under the curse of sin, and a fallen sinful nature. It's there. Now, we have to try to battle against it spiritually. All right, I'll stop right there. You can email me your thoughts. And if you're suffering from depression or discouragement, if there's anything I can help, please let me know. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. All right, thanks for listening. God bless.